Hi, hello. Okay, so uh, my name is Nathan, uh, and I'm going to be talking about building and uh, architecturing uh, Django alongside JavaScript applications. So I'm a full stack developer. Uh, I work with Django and React on most of the projects I work on. However, and despite the not so funny name of this talk, uh, after a few months I really start to dislike it. Uh, so despite the name, it's not about React. Um, most of what I'm going to say is uh, works exactly the same if you're using Angular, Vue, or Ember, any modern framework. Uh, if anything, it's maybe about Webpack, but we'll come back to this. Um, okay, so just to get started, by, by show of hand, who here uses a similar stack with a, a, a modern JS framework alongside Django? Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I really find th this exercise of setting up a JS framework alongside Django to uh, really not being a, a, a trivial exercise. Um, I think the main reason is there's no standard documented um, um, implementation guidelines or even architecture guidelines. Um, so I think it's something that we sk still can improve on, um, in the Django community. So it's something I've done quite a few projects, and my goal for this talk is to take you through um, some of the design decisions that we can make to try and build such an application, um, how it's going to work in development and production. Um, and, and in this talk, I'll also try and show you uh, what it ends up looking like in the code. Um, so before I start, a quick uh, catch up. Whoa. <laughs> I'm all right. Uh, quick catch up on the JS tool chain. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure everyone uh, knows about this. So very quickly, NPM is the main JavaScript um, uh, package repository. It's, it's, both, it's actually both the repository and the uh, client for the repository. So it's equivalent to both PyPI and pip. Um, Webpack is um, the main build tool for modern JS applications. So it's what produces the bundle. That's the, that's the JavaScript source code that ends up being shipped to the browser. There's no direct equivalent for this in Python because we can just run the Python code. And Webpack Dev Server is a wrapper around Webpack that, uh, much like the Django Hotel Reloader, uh, looks for changes in the source code, recompiles, and sells those files on the server. All right. Um, so in this first part, I want to go through Jeng a quick recap of Django's history and the tools we've had to handle JavaScript, source, uh, JavaScript files. And the goal here is also to set up a common vocabulary so we can all be talking about the same thing. Um, so it, when Django came out in 2005, um, the, um, the main use for JS back then was uh, to sprinkle on top of uh, uh, HTML pages that were otherwise generated by the backend. Um, and uh, for this, we had tools like Django Pipeline and Django Compressor, who came out in 20, uh, 2008, 2009. Um, and their, their main goal was to take this JavaScript source code that usually lived um, in the static folders of Django, uh, minify it, uh, gener uh, render um, a script tag in the, in the template, and that was it. Um, and a few less later, Django Unchained came out, and that really messed up my chart. So if you were wondering where the spec is, <laughs> that's Django Unchained. But around the same time, um, you can see the red and the blue lines. It's uh, Angular, and then a couple of years after, React. So the, the modern frameworks, that the, mo the most common modern frameworks started coming out in 2012, 2014, I think. Um, and those, tool, those frameworks need much more potent uh, build uh, pipelines. They need integration with um, the JS packages. They need to pull in dependencies from NPM. Um, they need um, to be able to work with uh, image files, font files, CSS, etc. Um, and so that's where uh, Django Pipeline and Django Compressor weren't enough anymore, and the front-end uh, community came up with something called Webpack, which solves all of this problem. Sorry. Um, and so a few years later, in 2015, Django Webpack Loader came out, and it's the, the first setup at integrating um, 
uh, Webpack and uh, Django together. Um, um, so the goal here was to really separate the responsibilities of building the JavaScript for um, for the browser and, and serving it. Before that, uh, Django Pipeline, Django Compressor, and Equivalent were doing all of this. From now on, um, we would leave Webpack, Webpack in charge of building this bundle and, and Django in charge of just generating a script tag that links to it. And so it transformed the development environment from a single process where Django is in charge of serving and generating the HTML and the JS to a dual environment where we have both Webpack and Django running. Um, and Django would still be in charge of generating uh, the HTML, but then point to Webpack, which would serve the JS. Um, so something else I want to mention in this section uh, is Emric Augustin's blog article series from last year, um, because they really helped me out and me on formulating um, a lot of what I've been thinking about. Um, so his blog article is about a series of uh, a formalization of the requirements for building a Django or JavaScript application. So it's very much linked to what I'm talking about. Um, and the main thing I, I, um, uh, I, I remembered from this is uh, his taxonomy of JS applications. There's basically two kinds of JS applications, or two, uh, two kinds of architecture. The single page application and in the hybrid applications. And I'll come back to this in the next couple of slides. And in, in, this, uh, in his blogs, he also talks about production and development parity, authentication, cores, CSRF, etc. So I really recommend going, them, going there if, uh, if you're working on Django and JavaScript. Um, so in, in Emric's taxonomy, uh, a single page application is an application where the, the HTML is purely static and uh, never changes. So it's not rendered by Django. It can be a static file that's served by Nginx or Apache alongside the, the, the JS files. And in this context, Django is purely used as an API. And so typically, in a production setting, uh, the browser would end up um, making requests to two different origins, the front end, where it would load all the static files, HTML, CSS, uh, uh, JS images, and uh, the back end, where Django runs, so as the API. And the counterpart is the hybrid application where um, the HTML is served by Django and, and potentially as a, as a template rendered by the Django Technology Engine. And so you end up with an application running where the DOM is a mix of the HTML that was generated by Django and whatever the JavaScript uh, framework, uh, whatever changes it brought to this DOM. Um, and typically, in the, in the hybrid application, the, the, the browser ends up only talking to one um, origin, where it would first load the HTML, which would be rendered for it, and then load the JS and API calls, of course. Um, so both infrastructures have pros and cons. There's no uh, silver bullet, of course. And even, even once you've been able to, to pick between single page application and hybrid application, depending on what's right for you, there's still a lot of implementation details that will vary between, um, between implementations. Still a lot more of design decisions. Um, so now that's exactly what I want to go through. From um, designing, uh, designing a Django and JavaScript architecture together. Um, so before we go and start making random design decisions, uh, it's probably better that we agree on a set of requirements first on what we want the application to be able to achieve. Um, so, of course, those requirements will vary a lot between projects, and the example I have here is something that's very typical for the project I work on, um, but they, are, they, are by no mean, um, they might not apply to your use case. For, for, for example, I think a typical requirement that I don't have is um, around Having to, having to separate the code base between front-end and back-end, having to separate also deployment flow between front-end and back-end. Um, I work in a team where everyone is full stack, so that's fine for me, but I know lots of companies out there have different teams for front-end and back-end, and I think if that was a requirement for you, you would end up with a very different solution. Um, but hopefully, I think the, the, the reasoning here will apply whatever your use case, and uh, um, you should be able to use this on your own projects. Um, so, sorry. My requirements are, I want uh, environment independent builds. So I'll come back to what I mean exactly for each of them in a minute. I want hot reloading and development. 
and I want development and production parity. So for environment independent build, uh, first, what do I mean by build? By build, I mean um, whatever code artifact you ship to a server when you deploy it. Could be a file archive, uh, a Docker image, um, a binary, a bit uh, unconventional in Python, but, or a, a commit in a, in a Git repository, for example. And why this, is some, why this is important to me is because it allows me to do version promotion. When I've had a, a version running in one environment for a while and I know it, it fixes the problem I intended to solve, then I can take this exact build, this exact set of uh, code, and then send it to a different environment. Uh, this is something that I discovered on Heroku a while back and it really stuck with me. Um, so yeah, so that brings, it brings a lot of trust in what I'm about to deploy and I know I'm not going to break the next environment down the line. So how, how might I achieve this? Um, the, the, the first, uh, the abuse answer is uh, to not have any environment specific values hard coded in, in the code. Uh, and, and the main way to do this is to use environment variables. The main, like, the main uh, what I'm talking about this section is very related to the 12-factor app. So if, if you don't know about this, I really recommend you go and read, uh, read the, the 12 pages on 12factor.net. It's, it's very interesting. So environment variables, they are really easy to use in Django. That's not a problem at all in the back end. We can read them anywhere on the code and read them in the settings and then read the settings. Um, so Django is really easy to write in an environment in a benign way, as long as you have access to environment variables on your server. Um, but in JavaScript, it's a bit of a different story. JavaScript is a bit harder. Uh, typically, uh, the, um, the main bit of config you would need in the JavaScript application is the API endpoint. Where, where am I going to send my request to? For example, in production, I might want to connect to api.example.com over HTTPS, while in development, I'm going to connect to localhost on port 8000 over HTTP. Um, and so, of course, JavaScript doesn't have a concept of environment variable. We can't set environment variables in our uh, users' uh, browsers. Um, so, as far as I can tell, that leaves us with two options. Either we find a way to load the config when the application starts from somewhere. That probably means an API call. And if we're making an API call to what endpoint? So it's kind of snake eating its own tail. It's, I, that's probably not going to work. The alternative I can see is to inject the configuration inside of the HTML during rendering in, um, so in Django. So that means that our HTML has to be a Django template, so that means we're using a hybrid application in, in Augustan's taxonomy. Um, and one way you might, uh, what, what this would translate in, uh, in the template, if this is the template for your JavaScript application, you might want to write a global config variable in JavaScript with the set of, this is an example, but I'm setting, for example, an API endpoint that's actually just a, a context variable in Django template, and also all the business logic values that are actually coming from the database. Right, okay, so that was environment uh, independence. Um, next, hot reloading in development. Um, so hot reloading is this very powerful, um, uh, front-end development feature that's very much like Django, what the Django Freeloader provides. Um, it's based on Webpack Dev Server, and as soon as I make a change in my JavaScript source code, then my front-end, my uh, browser refreshes, and I can see the change immediately in my browser. So it really shortens the feedback loop from writing a code and potentially a bug, and then detecting it. So this feature relies on Webpack Dev Server, as I just said, and there's actually two levels to it. There's live reloading where as soon as I make a change in my source code, then it's, it gets picked, picked up and my browser refreshes. So that means I do see the change in my browser, but I lose all the variable uh, values, I lose all of my context where I was in the application, etc. So it's a start, but not great. And then the hot reloading is the next step. Um, it's where instead of triggering a refresh of the page, Webpack Dev Server is going to send the new rebuild chunk of our WebSocket to the browser and the browser is going to replace it in place uh, without triggering a refresh, so I get to keep my variable where I was in the application, etc. Right, so let's start with hot, uh, hot reloading, actually, and it's going to be quick. Um, so hot reloading uses WebSocket and Webpack Dev Server, and as I just described, the way it looks like is in development, you'd load the HTML from Django, 
which would then point to the static files in Webpack Dev Server, and then every time you make a change to my JavaScript source code, then Webpack is going to ship those hot updates over WebSocket, and my application is going to update itself. So I've got one big problem with hot reloading, uh, and it's because I'm using Create React App, which is the main React boilerplate out there, and it's broken. I won't go into why. If you're interested, then we can discuss this after the talk. Um, but I'm waiting for uh, feedback from the, the folks at Facebook. If you are not using Create React App and you're using uh, a vanilla or a custom setup of a Webpack Dev Server, then they might just work. So taking a step back, and let's take a step back and just aim for live reloading. For live reloading to work, um, all I need is to make sure that my JavaScript source code is coming from Webpack Dev Server. Um, so um, that leaves us again with two options. Either when the application, when, when I load the page on my browser, it's able to tell which files I need on Webpack Dev Server and dynamically load, the, load them in the page. Or Django is able to render all of the scripts in the page for me where at uh, render time and serve the HTML to my browser so it loads the files. Um, and both of them work, both of them are fine. Um, and to help us decide between those two uh, uh, solutions, one, one thing we could do is look at the third criteria, development and production parity. So what is this going to look like in production? Well, in production, we won't have Webpack Dev Server running, of course. Um, so we will have to use, um, we will have to be able to uh, render script tags with the right URLs in the HTML. Uh, and for, for the development production parity requirement to work, then we should probably pick the same thing in development. Um, so now I have to be very honest with you and tell you that I've been doing solution one for a long time for absolutely no good reason. Um, and just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, so it's probably not readable from afar. Don't worry, I'll just uh, skim through it. Uh, if you've got good eyes, you can see several if debug, if not debug, etc. Um, so that's very bad for the remote production parity. And this, this big chunk in the middle here is actually manually fetching a manifest with the list of all the files in Webpack Dev Server and uh, dynamically adding them to the document here. Um, so it's very dirty, uh, and, and I mentioned Django Webpack Loader earlier, and I think that's where Django Webpack Loader um, could help a lot. We could transform this, and nice animation. We could replace all of this with just two lines, uh, render bundle for CSS and render bundle for JS, and this would work both in production and in development, removing the need for the if and else's, uh, and also the need for dynamically loading all of this. Um, so as I've said, I, I haven't tried this method yet. It's on my to-do list for the very short term. Uh, so I can't guarantee this is going to work, but I think this is the right way to go. Um, right, and about the development and production parity, it's actually very difficult to achieve 100% parity, especially between um, development and any other environment. Actually, if you think about it, my, my requirement around um, uh, development, um, sorry, environment independent builds is kind of a UAT versus production parity or staging versus production parity because uh, I want to make sure that they're exactly the same. Uh, but in development is different because you always end up using different, uh, different tools, different uh, servers. So it's difficult to reach 100% parity, but it's, it's still something that's definitely worth aiming for. Um, all right, so now that we've um, gone through these requirements and we've got uh, already a list of um, design decisions we've made, let's look at what it looks like in the code. Um, so this is our setup, uh, at least in development. And the, the main piece of integration between um, um, Django and JavaScript now resides in the template for the HTML uh, that's rendered by Django. Um, and so here we end up with the, uh, the, the main block here, setting the, 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 the config for the JavaScript application that's actually rendered by Django. Um, we have the two render bundle tags on the, for the CSS in the top and the JS at the bottom. And that's coming from our um, um, hot reloading requirement and development production parity requirement. 
Um, and that's it. So you, this is built for React, so there's a, there's a div with ID app, but you could really definitely adapt this to whatever um, uh, framework you're using. And you could actually you could actually build many other things pre-built pre into the HTML and just load the, uh, the, JS, uh, the JS application in a tiny part of the page. That's also an option here. Because we're using hybrid application, it gives us this flexibility around um, how much content do I want to be generated by Django and how much content do I want to be uh, taken care of by, uh, by, by JavaScript. Uh, so of course, once we have this template, we need a view to render it. Um, I thought I'd just show this just to show where I set the, where I define the context variable for rendering. I'm, I'm, in this example, I'm reading both from the settings and from uh, uh, models in the database, but you can pull in the information to configure your front-end application for where, wherever that makes sense in your case. Um, and finally, we need to mount this view on a URL. Um, which uh, needs to be generic enough so that we're going to set, uh, serve this HTML for every page of our JavaScript application, every URL uh, that's supported by your JavaScript application. Right, and um, in the front end, it's uh, even simpler. In the front end, there's no need to make any change to our JavaScript at least. The, the, the one tiny change that, needs, that we need to make is to make sure that our uh, Webpack configuration is able to uh, output um, a manifest, so a list of all the files that it just outputted last time it ran, so that uh, Django can then read this and, so, and, and link to all the files in the HTML. So that's, it's this one line here, the, uh, the bundle tracker plugin. Um, and finally, I thought I'd show you what my deployment uh, look like. So I use Docker, but if you use something similar, you still have the main steps which are first building the JavaScript application, so you, you output a, a set of um, um, JavaScript, CSS, images, whatever, and also a manifest file, which contains a list of all of those other files. Then copying this over to a static directory that's uh, controlled by Django, which Django has access to, and then finally running Collect Static, and from here, um, you know that um, the static files are available to be served, and Django Webpack Loader will know where to get those files from. Um, so he can link to them. Um, and that's it. So that's, it's, um, it's, not by, it's by far not a complete example. There's many other things that we probably would need to go through when designing a Django JavaScript application. Uh, things like uh, authentication, uh, cores, CSRF, although I wouldn't say that those, are, those last two are interesting topics, but they're in the list anyway. Uh, SEO, progressive web app support, etc. Um, and it's, 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 uh, most of these are actually topics that were covered by uh, Augustin in his, in his uh, article series, so if you're interested in this, I again recommend, highly recommend reading them. Um, so that's it for me. I think in conclusion, I'd, I'd say that um, we can still improve the state of the, the documentation of how, on how to integrate JavaScript and Django. Um, I'm, I don't think that Django is missing any feature to make this work properly. It's more about building the, documenting the, the, the known state of the art for this to work and, and giving examples for both code and, and architecture patterns. Um, right, and I'm also really curious to know how you guys manage your own JavaScript and, and Django applications, so feel free to come and talk to me after. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan. And do we have any questions from the audience? As usual, please line up. Anybody? No. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Oh, wait, one, one, one question. We have questions from the internet? Oh, there we go. Now we got Mike. Right. No, no, no. no. Oh, it's that one. Oh, yeah, there we go. 
if you open the floor for questions, there's always a question. Um, in your example code there, the, um, where you had the settings being rendered in Django and then the rest being done as hot reloading, yep. uh, one of the pieces that's in there is uh, uh, like this list of opening hours or something like that. Do you mean this? Yes, that's the one. Yep. So you've got, you have your opening hours being rendered as something from template. Yep. Um, that's not going to play well with the hot reloading, I would assume. Is, there, is that uh, it's like an example of something that you maybe want to try and mm. push through an API, or is there...? I'm not, no, I don't see why you wouldn't. So th this set of variables are... S Do you mean hot reloading or live reloading? Uh, sorry, live reloading, sorry. Live reloading. So on live reloading, every time I... Every time the, the browser is refreshed, then the HTML will be re recompiled and rerun. So those variables will be reset every time. Okay. And Django will re just re-render the same exact template every time. Right. So I don't think this would be a problem. Okay, but if, and then so on the JavaScript, on the hot reloading, um, that, so once the page renders once, the settings are only ever done on the page reload, but you can modify the JavaScript and then that, yeah. will, that won't pick up any changes there. Is that so, I don't think it creates problem with this because this variable is never reset. It's always defined globally. Right. Um, but it does create problem, um, especially, I think it's, especially it's, so hot reloading works really well for React components, for example. For ev everything visual is, is perfectly fine. Um, it works less well when you change a bit of logic somewhere. I couldn't explain you why. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert by far in, on hot reloading. Okay. Uh, but it yeah, does have limitations. I was wondering if there was any particular guidelines about what you keep in, what you can put in that kind of block. I think I think this is fairly flexible, and right. I'm I'm pretty confident that this is not going to be reset by either live reloading or, or hot reloading. Um, you can just see this as the main configuration object for your JavaScript application, and 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 put anything you want in there. Sure. Okay. Very quick question. Uh, first of all, I'm not a full stack, just a backend engi engineer, but uh, our team has some pro had some problems previously about the uh, uh, Django local uh, um, open server not uh, running over HTTPS. Did, do you have anything to... With HTTPS? Yes. Um, you don't no. have any problems in your React app? Uh, no, oops. I'm not sure. Uh, could, we could say lots of things about HTTPS. I'm not sure what exactly was your issue. Um, we couldn't serve the development server over HTTPS, and uh, React at some point has some problems, maybe uh, cross yeah. site. I don't know. Um, in development, I, I don't use HTTPS in development, and this has never been a problem to me. Uh, Webpack Dev Server runs over HTTP. Um, and, and once you're in production, the Webpack Dev Server doesn't matter anymore because you just output a set of static files that are always going to be served. Um, so I, I personally create a Nginx container for them, and, it, and they are served over HTTPS. So maybe your issue is, could be around um, requesting non-HTTP resources from a page that's served over HTTPS. I know there are limitations in, in browsers around this. Maybe, probably. Thank you. Good luck. All right, that was it for the questions. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you.